Back to the Future. Could it actually happen with a real time machine? Able to twist time into a loop. I can go from the past to the present to the future, but I'm on a loop, so I can go from the future back to the past. Humankind has been captivated by the thought of time travel for centuries. Some people think this fascination stemmed from hit movies like Interstellar, but this fascination is something that far predates the birth of these movies. There are questions raised about the feasibility of time travel. There are intriguing stories of people who claim to have experienced it firsthand. This raises the question, is time travel possible? If yes, is it safe then? Join us as we reveal the truth about a man with a time machine who suddenly vanished and reappeared with a terrifying message. The boy who built time machine to steal lottery numbers. The year is 1995 and a young Mike Markham, a 21-year student of electrical engineering living in Stanbury, Missouri, started working on his goal of building a time machine. His aim? To get rich by going to the future and stealing lottery numbers. He carried out most of his experiments on the back porch of his house, and boy was it a mess. It was the graveyard for home appliances with televisions, radios, and CDs all over the place. Mike had been messing around with a device called Jacob's Ladder when he noticed something strange had begun to happen. He was tinkering with Jacob's Ladder, which he had already modified to have a home-built electronic transformer with a power of about 20,000 volts. He had to build the transformer because the standard household voltage in the United States is 120 to 140 volts. For the conductors of Jacob's Ladder, Mike used wire hangers as well as lasers to heat the air around the conductor to take care of the air pressure and temperature changes, which had the potential to ruin all that he had worked for. Mike made a highly controversial claim while working with Jacob's Ladder. He claimed that a circular vortex appeared in his room and that it was about eight inches long. He figured that there was no harm in trying, so he threw a screw into it. According to Mike, every time he threw the screw into the vortex, it disappeared and reappeared a few seconds after. He was sure that the metal screw had traveled through time. Seeing this happen gave Mike the motivation he needed to go the extra mile. He was now going to build a time machine that would be 8 feet tall and not the 8-inch Jacob's Ladder. One thing was clear, however. The challenge ahead of Mike was a huge one. He required a lot of power to further his research to the point where it would work for humans. More so, he was scaling up his work on the so-called time machine when the device caught fire. Not one to be deterred, Mike reasoned that using bigger transformers to produce higher voltages would be more sensible if he were to rebuild the time machine. But looking at the financial implications of this, it would cost him about $20,000 per transformer. He could not afford that, so he broke into the local power plant and stole six old transformers to continue his work. But once he attached the transformers to Jacob's ladder, what would follow would be a massive blackout in the streets of his neighborhood, shutting down the electrical grid for several hours. The police soon arrived at his house with a search warrant to search around the place, and he was taken into custody soon after. Mike allegedly told the judge that during his trial he was attempting to find the lottery-winning numbers so that he could raise money for a research facility. He was sent to prison afterward. But here's where things get interesting for Mike. After getting out of prison, he became well-known on the local radio by continually sharing tales of the missing screw and his ambition to build the world's first time machine. The radio show in question, Art Bell's radio show frequently touched on paranormal topics, but Mike was quickly labeled a madman by the show's host, Art, a moniker that Mike quickly embraced. While on air, Mike informed Art and the audience that he was out of money and spare parts to continue his research and even went as far as broadcasting his phone number live. He would receive non-stop phone calls for the following three days. This time, Mike dared to dream. His next time machine would be more ambitious and more powerful than the first, thanks to donations from his listeners. He intended to test the time machine on himself by creating a vortex large enough for him to walk through. A year later, Mike returned to the radio show, and when he was asked what he would bring along in his journey to travel through time, he tilted toward taking his phone with him. In 1996, he claimed to be just 30 days away from completing his now legal time machine. 
However, in 1997, Mike disappeared without warning and was never heard from again, placing him at the center of the mysteries associated with time travel. Not long after his disappearance, one of the show's devout listeners called in to share an odd tale that they had stumbled upon. According to the listener, police discovered a deceased man on a beach in California in the 1930s. The man had been crushed to death inside an odd metal tube, and what added more to the intrigue was that a cell phone had been discovered next to his phone. Nobody would hear anything about Mike again until 2022, when it appeared that Mike came online to refute the wild rumors that he died after traveling to the 1930s. Furthermore, there were reports that he had been interviewed for a third time in 2015 by this local radio station. In February of that year, Mike appeared to post a blog activity using the username RailMadmanMarkham. The user had been registered with the website since 2015, and he wrote, Rumors are blazing that I am dead, not well, and had time traveled to 1930 where I had died on a beach in a tube. Whoever posted those pictures is a redhead, and it's also not me. It was some school kid with my name that someone long attributed to me. Whatever was found in the 1930s was not me, and I've read and read that it was debunked but can't find the article. In a response to the question about his intentions for a time machine, he responded in the affirmative and said it was stalled until he got some inverters. Whilst his followers have urged him to provide proof that he is Mike the Madman, he has yet to provide any such evidence. As such, it remains a mystery whether or not Mike still exists. The story of Mad Mike raised multiple questions about whether or not time travel was even possible. Was it all a ruse? Can we believe a word that comes out of the mouths of these time travelers? We can't know unless we hear the story of another time traveler. Fierce storm causes pilot to travel forward in time. Air Marshal Sir Robert Victor Goddard claimed to have accidentally traveled four years into the future while still serving as a wing commander in 1935. Sir Goddard was given the task of examining an abandoned airbase in Dram, Scotland, which was close to Edinburgh. Whilst flying above this airbase, Sir Goddard observed and saw that it was in disrepair and that cattle were grazing on the tarmac. It was completely desolate and in terrible condition from years of neglect. While flying in his biplane, he encountered a strange storm. Strong winds and storm clouds with a bizarre brownish-yellow hue overtook his craft and made him lose control of his plane. Soon it began to spiral into a fall, but given his many years of flying and wealth of experience, he managed to gain control of his aircraft and he flew out of the storm into the greatest shock of his life. Upon flying out of the storm, he flew into brilliant sunlight. What had previously been a horrible storm day was now a beautiful day, with the sun smiling down on him. As if that was not shocking enough, he looked down and saw that the airbase, which was abandoned and in terrible condition a few seconds ago, was now in excellent condition, and to his shock, was even in operation. He saw some mechanics in blue coveralls, working on yellow planes parked on the runway. What struck him again was that the aircraft were quite different from those of 1935. Interestingly enough, Sir Goddard could not even identify one of the aircraft. It was beyond his knowledge how any renovation work could have taken place in just a few seconds. Moreover, the mechanics were not wearing the normal khaki, which was the standard uniform that mechanics wore in 1935. It also did not make sense that the planes were yellow because the Air Force painted all their planes silver. Sir Goddard must have tried to make logical sense of what was going on, but nothing made sense at that point. He could not explain the unusual experience. However, when he returned to Dram four years later amidst a European war, he was in for the biggest shock of his life. What he had seen in the switch between the storm and the beautiful day was exactly what he exactly, what he met at the airbase, to his surprise. He saw the same mechanics in the same overalls, working on the same planes. He even found the plane that he could not register then, the Miles Magister. Many skeptics have said that Sir Goddard must have gotten confused. 
They believed that he had simply landed somewhere else in 1935, and not the abandoned airbase in Dram. But that still does not explain the many details in his story. The Miles Magister, for example, did not make its first flight until 1937, two years after Sir Goddard had seen it on the runway in Dram. The colors of the mechanic uniforms and planes were not in use until years later. The strange storm that suddenly went away, revealing a bright and sunny day, all point to a supernatural experience that cannot simply be explained away. Sir Goddard, in his time travel, at least provided us with vivid descriptions of what he saw. Whilst many skeptics doubt his story, which is what skeptics do anyway, his story doesn't leave much room for unbelief. Hopefully, the next time travel story is not as full of loopholes as the ones we just discussed. Another incident occurred where three people claimed to have seen a time traveler from the past. Disappearing cars. Back in 1988, Strange Magazine 2 published an article written by Ken Mo titled Time Traveler. The article was about the shocking account of a man who would go by the name L.C. back in 1969. L.C. and his business associate, Bob's fake name, were driving along Highway 167 towards the oil center city of Lafayette after finishing lunch in the southwest Louisiana town of Abbeville, United States. It was the 20th of October around 1.30 p.m. The day was perfect with a blue sky and cool breeze. Up ahead, they spotted an old turtle car moving slowly. They were intrigued by the vehicle. It wasn't something either of them had seen before, very unique and antique. But here's the thing. Even though the vehicle looked like a blast from the past, it was in mint condition. The two overtook the vehicle, but not before slowing down right next to it to check it out in detail. The car had a very distinct large bright orange license plate with the year 1940 printed on it, which was quite odd because antique cars like the one in question weren't allowed to be driven on the road unless it was being used for a ceremonial parade. Things just got weirder from there. The person driving the car was a young woman dressed in what appeared to be a vintage dress from the 40s complete with a hat and a fur coat. There was a small child as well, dressed in a heavy coat and a cap. As they pulled up next to the car, the lady started panicking. One could make out her face going pale with fear. She frantically started looking back and forth, as if she was in the middle of somewhere unknown, as if she needed some help. She was almost about to cry. Elsie asked her if she needed any help, to which she responded in the affirmative. But at no point did she roll down the window or even look him in the eye. After requesting her several times to halt the vehicle, they finally saw her pull over on the side of the road. LC and Bob passed her and pulled over in front of her. But as soon as they looked behind, the vehicle was gone. Poof. Vanished into thin air. This was a highway without any traffic, so disappearing like this was quite impossible. Shocked and not knowing how to describe what had just happened, LC and Bob decided to keep driving on. A little while later, while they were still on Highway 167, they saw another new car pass a very old car at a really slow speed. It was so slow that it looked like the cars had come to a halt. As soon as the new car pulled over in front of the car, the same thing happened. It stopped and then suddenly disappeared. They couldn't believe their eyes. Even the guy in the other car was completely shocked. The three started describing what each had seen. They started walking around the area. The third guy insisted they should be reporting this to the police, as this, according to him, was a missing person case. L.C. and Bob refused, more so because they had no idea where the woman and the child along with the car had vanished. The third man couldn't go to the cops without these two. Everyone would think this guy was mad. But he exchanged phone numbers and addresses and kept talking about the incident with them just to make sure he didn't lose his mind. Could she have been a time traveler from the past who went forward in time? Or could she have been a person from the past who could never go back, stuck in limbo? One can never tell with certainty. Also, we all know how important it is for news channels to be the first outlets to break a story. Now, what would happen if they got their hands on a story a decade before it occurred? 
the news that broke 11 years before it happened. This spine-chilling story was a part of the book, The Little Giant Book, of eerie thrills and unspeakable chills written by Ron Edwards, C.B. Colby, and John Macklin. According to the authors, back in 1932, newspaper reporter J. Bernard Hutton and photographer Joachim Brandt were sent to do a feature story on the Hamburg shipyard in Germany. After completing their assignment, just as they were about to leave the premises, they heard the sound of aircraft engines only to look up and see the sky full of fighter planes. The anti-aircraft batteries opened fire and bombs started going off. All of a sudden, this place had become a war zone. Things were exploding, buildings were collapsing, and there was death and chaos everywhere. Before rushing out to save their lives, Hutton even asked a security guard if there was something they could do to help out, but was asked to immediately leave the area instead. As the two drove into Hamburg, things changed. The sky cleared up and everything was back to normal. There was no blood or violence. Buildings were fine. No one seemed to panic. It was as if nothing had happened. When Hutton and Brandt looked behind towards the shipyard, they couldn't spot anything wrong with it. No damage and no smoke coming from the buildings. Shocking. The newspaper office did not believe the two. Even the pictures that Brandt had been taking during the attack showed everything to be normal. The shipyard looked as good as new. Their colleagues dismissed their claim by deciding that they must have stopped on their way for a drink, and it was the alcohol making them see things. Bernard Hutton later moved to London just before the Second World War began. In 1943, what he read in a newspaper one morning almost made his heart stop. It was a story about a successful raid by a Roy Air Force squadron on the Hamburg shipyard. The resemblance was uncanny. This was an exact representation of what he and Brandt witnessed 11 years back. So mysterious. One question that has lingered on is the question of the possibility of time travel. Will humans ever achieve time travel? Is there technology that can enable humans to go into the future? Science still doesn't believe time travel. Many people believe that Mike just changed his name to live a low-key life away from the spotlight while some still believe that his time travel journey was successful. While many physicists do not believe that time travel is possible, in theoretical physics, several theories and hypotheses suggest that traveling through time is possible, although each one comes with its challenges. Let us take a look at one of the more prominent theories that support the possibility of time travel. Einstein's General Theory of Relativity According to Einstein's General Theory of Relativity, Gravity also affects clocks. The more forceful the gravity nearby, the slower time goes. Near massive bodies, near the surface of neutron stars or even at the surface of the Earth, although it's a tiny effect, time runs slower than it does far away, says Dave Goldberg, a cosmologist at Drexel University. If a person were to hang out near the edge of a black hole, where gravity is prodigious, Goldberg says, only a few hours might pass for them, while 1,000 years went by for someone on Earth. If the person who was near the black hole returned to this planet, they would have effectively traveled to the future. That is a real effect, he says. That is completely uncontroversial. Going backward in time gets thorny, though thornier than getting ripped to shreds inside a black hole. Scientists have come up with a few ways it might be possible, and they have been aware of time travel paradoxes in general relativity for decades. Fabio Costa, a physicist at the Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics, notes that an early solution with time travel began with a scenario written in the 1920s. That idea involved a massive long cylinder that spun fast in the manner of straw, rolled between your palms, and that twisted space-time along with it, the understanding that this object could act as a time machine allowing one to travel to the past only happened in the 1970s, a few decades after scientists had discovered a phenomenon called closed time-like curves. A closed time-like curve describes the trajectory of a hypothetical observer that, while always traveling forward in time from their perspective, at some point finds themselves at the same place in time where they started, creating a loop, Costa says. This is possible in a region of space-time that, warped by gravity, loops into itself. 
Einstein read about time-like curves and was very disturbed by this idea, he adds. The phenomenon nevertheless spurred later research. Also, is it possible to derive a time travel theory from a book, and one written in as far back as the 19th century? Well, let's find out. Book that inspired time travel in millions. The idea of a time machine was popularized by H.G. Wells's 1895 novel, The Time Machine. It is uncertain whether time travel to the past would be physically possible. Such travel, if at all feasible, may give rise to questions of causality. Forward time travel, outside the usual sense of the perception of time, is an extensively observed phenomenon and is well understood within the framework of special relativity and general relativity. However, making one body advance or delay more than a few milliseconds compared to another body is not feasible with current technology. As for backward time travel, it is possible to find solutions in general relativity that allow for it, such as a rotating black hole. Traveling to an arbitrary point in space-time has very limited support in theoretical physics and is usually connected only with quantum mechanics or wormholes. Time travel is not something that just sprung into existence by itself. It has its origins in myths, religions, and cultures. It would be wrong to talk about time travel without touching on these parts of it that remain intricate to time travel. Time in heaven and earth are different. Some ancient myths depict a character skipping forward in time. In Hindu mythology, the Vishnu Purana mentions the story of King Raivata Kakudmi, who travels to heaven to meet the creator Brahma, and is surprised to learn when he returns to earth that many ages have passed. The Buddhist Pali Kanan mentions the relativity of time. The Payasi Sutta tells of one of the Buddha's chief disciples, Kumara Kasapa, who explains to the skeptic, Payasi, that time in the heavens passes differently than on earth. The Japanese tale of Urashima, first described in the Manyoshu, tells of a young fisherman named Urashima, who visits an undersea palace. After three days, he returns home to his village and finds himself 300 years in the future, where he has been forgotten, his house is in ruins, and his family has died. In Jewish tradition, the first century BC scholar, Honi Hamagel, is said to have fallen asleep and slept for 70 years. When waking up, he returned home, but found none of the people he knew, and no one believed his claims of who he was. As the world progressed, fewer people started to believe in myths, and the world of time travel experienced a shift to science fiction. Time travel now seen as only science fiction. Time travel themes in science fiction and the media can be grouped into three categories. Immutable timeline, mutable timeline, and alternate histories, as in the interaction of several alternate worlds interpretations. The non-scientific term timeline is often used to refer to all physical events in history, so that where events are changed, the time traveler is described as creating a new timeline. Early science fiction stories feature characters who sleep for years and awaken in a changed society or are transported to the past through supernatural means. Amongst them are Rip Van Winkle, 1819, by Washington Irving, Looking Backward, 1888, by Edward Bellamy, and When the Sleeper Awakes, 1899, by H.G. Wells. Prolonged sleep, like the later more familiar time machine, is used as a means of time travel in these stories. The date of the earliest work about backward time travel is uncertain. The Chinese novel, Supplement to the Journey to the West Sea, 1640, by Dong Yue, features magical mirrors and jade gateways that connect various points in time. The protagonist, Sun Wukong, travels back in time to the world of the ancients, Qin Dynasty, to retrieve a magical bell and then travels forward to the world of the future Song Dynasty to find an emperor who has been exiled in time. However, the time travel is taking place inside an illusory dream world created by the villain to distract and entrap him. Samuel Madden's Memoirs of the 20th Century, 1733, is a series of letters from British ambassadors in 1997 and 1998 to diplomats in the past conveying the political and religious conditions of the future. 
Because the narrator receives these letters from his guardian angel, Paul Alcon suggests in his book, Origins of Futuristic Fiction, that the first time traveler in English literature is a guardian angel. Madden does not explain how the angel obtains these documents, but Alcon asserts that Madden deserves recognition as the first to toy with the rich idea of time travel in the form of an artifact sent backward from the future to be discovered in the present. In the science fiction anthology, Far Boundaries editor August Derleth claims that an early short story about time travel is an anachronism, or Missing One's Coach, written for the Dublin Literary Magazine by an anonymous author in the June 1838 issue. While the narrator waits under a tree for a coach to take him out of Newcastle upon Tyne, he is transported back in time over a thousand years. He encounters the venerable Bede in a monastery and explains to him the developments of the coming centuries. However, the story never makes it clear whether these events are real or a dream. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe to our channel and check out another of our interesting videos.